Hey guys, I'm Dov, and today I'm back with an overview of the Empire. So, uh, a few months back I did an overview of Norska, kind of talked about their roster and the faction as a whole, and I want to do the same for the Empire, and the purpose of this video is uh, a few things. Number one is for those people who are playing Game 2 and haven't purchased Game 1, and so they don't have access to the Empire, this is going to go through their roster and talk about their different units so that you know what you're fighting. Uh, this video is meant for not only people who are going to be playing the Empire, fighting with them in multiplayer, but also people fighting against them. I'm going to talk about both their strengths and weaknesses, and we'll kind of go through some different things. So let's get started with the roster itself. Uh, Lord Choices, you've got uh, pretty decent Lord Choices across the board. I have to say, Lords and Heroes, for the most part, for the Empire, are all useful and have their niche, and some of them are quite powerful. So, uh, starting with the basic General of the Empire. So, he's got access to a horse, a Barded Warhorse. The Barded Warhorse just gives him a bit more armor at the cost of some speed. Both of them give uh, more health and charge bonus, obviously. Pegasus gives even more charge bonus and a lot of speed and obviously puts him up in the air. And then you've got your Griffin, your terror-causing, uh, you know, armor-piercing, flying monster. In terms of abilities and items, he's got relatively standard stuff. Hold the Line is the sort of faction ability for the Empire. It was changed recently to be a bit better. It's an area of effect, plus 5 melee defense, and plus 4 leadership. So nothing game-breaking, certainly. But pl that plus 5 melee defense in particular is always nice to have, especially because it's a constant area of effect. It's not conditional in any way, so you'll just be getting that basic uh, plus 5 melee defense, plus 4 leadership, which is quite nice. And you'll see quite a few of the Empire characters have this trait, so if you have the extra funds, it's certainly useful to take. Foe Seeker, fa fairly self-explanatory, and stand your ground as well. In terms of his items, he's got this Charmed Shield, which is, I think, probably what his his best ability or item is, what sets him apart the most, uh, mainly due to the fact that you can give this guy an extra missile block chance, so against a faction that's going to heavily snipe you with wood elves, uh, sorry, with uh, arrows like the wood elves, yes, the, the, the trees are going to throw wood elves at you, um, and so the charm shield with its 22% damage resistance and more importantly 24 missile parry uh, will help mitigate some of that so you take your general of the empire probably want to put him on a horse uh, to get maximum speed and then you get this uh, charm shield here to help mitigate some of the damage nice and cheap and also relatively survivable as well <clears throat> The Rune Fang's the other item. It's a little bit expensive for what it gives you. It does give you quite a bit of a weapon strength increase, but the General of the Empire doesn't have that great of combat stats. So how useful it is is a little bit debatable. I mean, I guess if you're like on the Griffin and you pop a nice uh, uh, support buff on him, then maybe you could get some good work done with the Rune Fang. But it's a pretty expensive item, so it's not something you would take typically. Moving on to Boris Toddbringer, he's basically a general of the Empire, he doesn't have the regular horse, but same mount options otherwise. In terms of his abilities, he's got uh, the same, plus a few. Uh, he's got Crush the Weak here, which is a conditional area of effect debuff. If an opposing unit is lower than 50% leadership, they get minus 5 melee defense and melee attack, and minus 4 leadership, which is a very, very useful little debuff there, especially because Griffins... Uh, which you're most likely going to see Boris on the Griffin, do come with the, uh, oh, I, uh, this one actually doesn't come with Blood Roar. They used to all come with Blood Roar, Roar. interesting. So Boris's Griffin does not actually have this Blood Roar trait, I don't think. Let's see. Yeah, I don't see it on there. That's really interesting. Um, so yeah, that actually doesn't help very much because the Blood Roar is in fact an area of effect minus 8 leadership, so... Yeah, but nonetheless, he does cause fear and terror, so likely you're going to be <clears throat> throwing him into the rear or side of a unit with that fear and terror proccing. That Crush the Weak will probably come into play. Uh, he's also got Foe Seeker, of course, and Deadly Onslaught, which we'll see quite a bit of as well. 20% uh, AP and weapon damage and 36% charge bonus, which is quite useful, uh, being that Boris has a pretty good charge bonus himself. 
What makes Boris unique, though, is the Midland Rune Fang. It gives him regeneration, constant replenishment of hit points, uh, particularly up on the Griffin. It's a very powerful item to have. And then the White Cloak of Ulrich is another very nice uh, area of effect debuff. Minus 9 melee attack, minus 6% speed. Very useful melee uh, debuff and speed debuff as well. Uh, area of effect. And it, this one's not conditional, so you'll always be getting value from this, as opposed to the Crush of the Weak, which is conditional, so you may want to consider cutting that if you're really trying to slim for cost. Um, but uh, moving on, we've got one of my new favorite characters, the Arch Lector. So he's kind of the Lord level priest support character. Um, he's got lots of uh, abilities here. In terms of mounts, only a horse or a barded warhorse. Nothing fancy, no griffins for him. Uh, but he does have quite a few abilities. So Benediction is a plus 8 leadership in an area of effect. Pretty decent, but for the cost, it's 128 gold. Um, it's not amazing, but if you have the extra points, it's certainly nice. Same thing with this Divine Power. It's a pretty big area of effect, but still, you're going to have to keep your Arch Lector near to an opposing caster to get that 50% miscast chance on them. Eh, useful, but it's a little bit conditional, so I'll sometimes cut this to make him a little bit cheaper. The big one, though, are the next three. The big ones, I should say. Uh, the Grand Hammer of Sigmar is a massive area of effect, uh, 40 meter radius, very long lasting, 50 seconds is very long lasting. Uh, Battle Prayer, so it's a, a buff that gives 26 melee attack in that area of effect, which is a pretty substantial melee buff, uh, <clears throat> particularly for a faction that already has decent all around stats. Um, yeah, the Grand Hammer Sigma are very useful. The Grand Shield of Faith, likewise, same area of effect, same length. This is 22% damage resistance, which mitigates all forms of damage by 22%. So that these two buffs make him one of the best support characters in the game. Then Grand Soulfire on top of that gives your own units 90% magic resistance and then calls down a bombardment uh, that will damage your enemies. It doesn't do a whole lot of damage, but the 90% magic resistance is really the best part of this. Uh, when you're fighting a unit like Grail Knights, for example, if you have your Arch Lecter supporting your Demigriff Knights, you can pop this Grand Soulfire, mitigate all of the magic damage that the, uh, that the Grail Knights are going to do, and your Demigriff Knights will then just wreck them with the Grand Hammer Sigmar active. So, yeah, very, very strong support character and very cheap as well. He's also got the Crown of Command, which is a nice item, uh, not something you'll typically take, but uh, this other one as well, the Mace of Hellstrom gives fire damage and 50% weapon damage uh, for 41 seconds. It's pretty expensive for what it gives you. I mean, I guess if you really want the fire damage, but honestly, the Arch Lector is not really a combat character anyway, so you probably are going to want to be uh, trying to use your value to buff up other units um, since he's more of a support character. Anyway, uh, moving on, we've got the one caster, le uh, Lord level caster for the Empire, Balthazar Gelt, the beloved uh, warhorse and barded warhorse, and of course his uh, named Pegasus, Quicksilver. Which, uh, by the way, if you check, Balthazar has decent combat stats for a mage, 34 attack, 38 defense is not terrible, um, but if you put him up on the Pegasus, he gets a 70 charge bonus, as well as 50 armor, uh, which is not too bad at all, so... Uh, Balthazar has, of course, Lore of Metal, so he's got the Evasion, Arcane Conduit being that he's a Lore level caster, and of course Metal Shifting as the Lore of Metal attribute, and then your standard Lore of Metal spells, Searing Doom, very cost effective, uh, Bombardment, good against low armor, and even against cavalry, uh, Plague of Rust, very cost effective armor debuff, Kahena's Hounds is a decent Vortex, not amazing, but it's okay, Glittering Robe is a it's an alright buff. The gold cost is a little bit more for what it gives you, but 30 armor and 8 leadership can be pretty decent, especially on lighter units like state troops or flagellants. Uh, we've got final transmutation, your hated direct damage spell, and transmutation of lead, which is a nice big area of effect 26 melee attack debuff. Pretty nice debuff overall. And then his one item is the Staff of Volans, which just gives him a massive Winds of Magic recharge. So that allows Balthazar Gelt. He's one of the only characters in the game who can reliably get two overcast final transmutations in a given match. So he's a very powerful caster. Even without final transmutation, in particular, Searing Doom and Plague of Rust are very good cost-effective spells when you're proccing that metal shifting map wide. It's very, very useful. Moving on to Prince and Emperor himself, Karl Franz. Yes, indeed, the powerhouse. 
he has become somewhat of a powerhouse. He's still not, like, amazing, but he's, I'd put him on, on the same tier as, uh, Kolek and Krokar, maybe just towards the bottom of that tier, but still. Uh, he's got a nice mount selection. He's basically like a general of the Empire with a bit better stats. He does have AP on all of his mounts, being that he wields that, uh, two-handed hammer, Galmaraz. Um, and yeah, he's got uh, Horus, Part of Warhorse, Pegasus, and his named uh, Griffin, Deathclaw. And it is worth noting, Deathclaw does now give him a bit more weapon strength, puts him up to 90 charge bonus, a substantial health increase, and of course much more speed as well. So we're going to be showing his stats on Deathclaw from now on. He's got Hold the Line, Foe Seeker, and Stand Your Ground, same as the General. And then in terms of his items here, he's got some really nice items. The Reichland Rune Fang is a plus 26 melee attack, plus 8 leadership in area of effect. Pretty big area of effect, 400 meters. And uh, yeah, very nice buff to have. And then Galmaraz is a self buff, gives him 40% AP, which is huge. And then a plus 16 bonus versus large as well, which is very, very nice. Makes him great for tackling big monsters. And moving on to the final Lord, Volkmar the Grim, the Grand Theogenist. And uh, he's got a horse, Barded Warhorse, or his special mount, the War Altar of Sigmar. Uh, so he's basically like a legendary level Arch Lector. He's got all the same abilities. However, if he's up on the uh, the War Altar, his uh, Pimp Cart, as it's known, uh, he also gets access to Bound Banishment, which can tear apart infantry uh, blobs, uh, particularly good against the Skaven. Volkmar, in general, is just going to be your go-to pick most of the time against the Skaven. Uh, he's got massive magic resistance as well on the uh, on the cart. You can see his base resistance is 15 and 25. And then if you put him up on the cart, it goes up to 40% magic resistance, still 15% missile. And then, of course, he has his other mitigation abilities as well. And that magic resistance means that uh, units like Warp Lightning Cannons are going to do very little to him. Poison Wind Globet Ears, that sort of thing. Then, on top of that, he also has self-healing, of course, with his one item, the Jade Griffin. So, very strong character against uh, Skaven, pretty good against the Dwarves as well. Well, somewhat. Uh, he's a bit of a big target for something like a cannon. But, uh, yeah, can be decent in other matchups as well. And, basically, he's just like your, uh, your infantry lawnmower, <laughs> essentially. So... Yeah, you've got your uh, your monster killer in Karl Franz, your infantry lawnmower in in uh, Volkmar. Balthazar is kind of your uh, caster lord, so if you want to take more heroes, then you take Balthazar. He's also kind of your lord sniper as well with that final transmutation. The arch is kind of the cheap support character. Boris is your tank lord. And the general is just kind of your uh, all-arounder, I guess. And your missile sponge as well, if you want to look at him that way. Uh, moving on to the hero choices, the Empire Captain is not the best hero in the world, but he's relatively cheap, I guess. Uh, he does carry hold the line, which is nice. Um, he's got uh, Warhorse, Spartan Warhorse, and Imperial Pegasus. He doesn't have the best combat stats, non-AP weapon strength, and less than 400 weapon strength total means that he's really kind of an underwhelming combat character. Out of all the Empire Lords and Heroes, he's probably the most underwhelming. I would say. Uh, just really doesn't have that many useful abilities. He's got the sort of anti-heroes. I mean, cool. Uh, the Potion of Foolhardiness is kind of cool. If you put him up on the Pegasus, he gets an 85 charge bonus. And then you can pop that Potion of Foolhardiness to give him even more charge bonus. But that makes him pretty expensive. I mean, yeah, you could maybe snipe out a caster with something like this. But I do think that you have better options available to you. Uh, moving on, we've got the Witch Hunter. This guy is your assassin archetype character, and he also has a very nice armor-piercing ranged attack that does magic damage. He's got Slippery, which just gives him more speed and melee defense for a given time, helps him get away. Accusation is a direct damage um, ability. It's basically like Spirit Leech. It does do magic damage, um, but yeah, he's got three charges of that. It's like a... A more powerful, slightly more powerful Spirit Leech does a pretty good amount of damage, very good against characters and other single entities. He's also got these other two abilities here. Skull of Katab reduces uh, an enemy's power recharge rate, which is very useful if you have a... Uh, you know, if you're going up against a very magic-heavy faction like the Vampires, you can continuously spam this on their caster and reduce the... Uh, the rate at which they're able to cast spells, which is nice. And then, of course, Opal Amulet makes him a bit more tanky, but usually I'll just run him with the only accusation to make him nice and cheap. 
And then on to my favorite uh, hero is the Warrior Priest. He's got a horse, a bard of war horse, and he's basically just like a mini Arch Lector. His buffs aren't quite as good. I mean, he's got the same Divine Power and Benediction. This is actually the same effect, so you don't want to necessarily double layer on that. These ones are different effects, though. The Hammer of Sigmar, Soul Fire, and Shield of Faith are basically just mini versions of the same abilities the Arch Lector has. Don't have quite as big of an area of effect and don't last quite as long, but still very powerful support buffs. Especially uh, something like this. If you just run the Hammer of Sigmar and a horse, he's only 500, almost 600 points, and it makes buffing up uh, Demigriff Knights in particular or other units of Knights very, very powerful. Or you could even run him in the front line on foot with just that uh, melee attack buff and help buff up some great swords. In general, a great sport character. He's also got the Banner banner of Eternal Flame, which is a uh, quite nice, again, support ability. It's a constant area of effect, fire damage, and 6% weapon damage. Mainly, though, the fire damage is what's nice. The Empire has a lot of fire damage, as you'll see. Uh, they can really synergize well with the Kindle Flame from a Bright Wizard to get some good value there. And anyone that's weak to fire... Uh, particularly, like, let's say you're fighting the vampires, you know you'll potentially face the Terrorgeist, a Mortis Engine, uh, potentially, like, Varix Reavers or the Sternsmen. There are a lot of units on the vampire roster that are weak to fire damage. So, assuming you're going to be running this guy around with your Demigriff Knights, it makes sense to grab that Banner of Eternal Flame to give your Demigriff Knights that fire damage to be able to kill those regenerating units even faster. Anyway, another nice little support buff, one of the best support characters in the game in my opinion. And then of course we have the casters. The Empire has one of the widest selections of magic available to any faction. They have shadows, beasts, life, light, fire, and heavens. All of which are useful in their own right. I find reasons to take all of these lore of magics in various matchups. Uh, we'll talk about them more specifically. Um, the only one I want to talk about individually is uh, the Amber Wizard, mostly because he also has a Griffin Mount, which of course gives him Fear and Terror, massive AP weapon strength, doesn't get a whole lot of armor because he's he, he's less than clothed and his Griffin isn't, doesn't have any armor as well. So yeah, he has Lore of Beasts, nothing surprising there, your typical Lore of Beasts stuff, but he does have the Griffin Mount, which is a nice, nice little addition there for the Amber Wizard. But, uh, yeah, in terms of magic selection, uh, depending on your lore choice, I mean, obviously, lore of life is you're going to be your standard go-to, especially if you're running cavalry-heavy builds, um, lore of light, if you're running missile-heavy builds, if you're running a fire build, obviously, you'll want a bright wizard, lore of shadows is good if you have a lore that can self-heal and you're really looking for some good utility abilities, um, and then lore of beasts if you want that extra terror bombing. And Lore of Heavens, again, if you want some, it's kind of like Lore of Shadows, if you want some good utility, and maybe you, you're bringing either Boris or Volkmar, where they already have self-healing, and you just want some extra punching power there. Yeah, that's pretty much it for the Lords and Heroes, quite a bit uh, in that section, so things should go a bit faster from here, but uh, next, let's talk about State Troops. We've got... Uh, Spearmen, Spearmen with Shields, and Swordsmen. Uh, Spearmen and Spearmen with Shields, obviously... Uh, same unit, just with shields. It is worth noting, though, Spearmen with Shields do have different attack animations that are slightly faster. Um, <clears throat> so they do have a uh, almost... Like, it's almost negligible. But they do have a slightly higher DPS. And then, of course, your Swordsman or your Sword-type unit. Uh, honestly, State Troops are some of the most cost-effective low-tier troops in the game. Being that they have pretty good combat stats in general, you can see Swordsman, 32 melee attack, 32 melee defense for 400 points. Not bad at all. Spearman with shields, 42 melee defense, which makes them a really nice uh, anvil for cavalry-heavy builds. Um, we've got... Uh, uh, halberdiers as well, which are a bit expensive for what they get. They do have a little bit better stats, and they also have expert charge defense. Their biggest issue is that they don't have a shield, they don't have any kind of missile block chance, and they are more expensive. So, against missile heavy factions, I would definitely recommend against halberdiers. You're going to want to go with spearmen with shields and swordsmen against factions like high elves, wood elves, dwarves, anyone you're going to get shot at a lot. You're going to want to have that missile block chance against factions like Vampires and Chaos. It may be worth bringing the Halberdiers for the AP and the charge defense against all 
uh, the expert charge defense, as it also as it is also known. In terms of regiments of renown, the swordsmen have a regiment of renown variant, the Sigmar's Sons, who are unbreakable, which is always nice. They also have just better stats all around. They have more health. They have a better charge bonus, slightly more weapon strength. Of course, they're unbreakable, so their leadership is uh, much higher. <laughs> and uh, they do also have better combat stats to come with being a Regiment of Renown. So, overall, Sigmar Sun's one of the best Regiments of Renown in the game, in my opinion. Super cost-effective for what they give you, and definitely an include in most Empire armies. Moving on, in terms of infantry, we've got the Flagellants. These are your kind of quote-unquote DPS infantry. They're unbreakable, which is uh, nice. They'll never rout. They also have Frenzy, which uh, being that they're unbreakable means that their Frenzy will never drop, which is always nice. Uh, they have incredibly poor defensive stats, so only 10 melee defense and 0 armor. However, they do have this other ability here, Strength of the Penitent. So uh, it'll activate in melee, last 15 seconds, and it will recharge if they're losing. It only takes 3 seconds to recharge, so essentially if they're losing, they're going to continuously get this buff where they get 14 melee defense, which, uh, you know, definitely helps. Puts them up to 24 melee defense, which is actually not too bad, and then 12% physical resistance. Um, so yeah, if they're losing, they'll lose a little bit worse, or I guess they'll lose a little bit less would be a better way, way of saying that. But uh, they also do have a Regiment of Renown version, the Tatter Souls. The main difference with them is they gain 30 unit models. You can see right here the unit model count by, goes up by 30, and of course their health goes up by the appropriate amount as well. And their combat stats increase as is uh, consistent with a Regiment of Renown. Flagellants, pretty good in some matchups against low armor. Again, same thing with Halberdiers, very vulnerable to missiles, so you're probably not going to want to bring these guys versus Wood Elves, High Elves, or other missile factions. But against lower armor factions like potentially the Skaven, uh, Beastmen, maybe even the Greenskins, uh, you know, other lower armor factions, uh, can be very, very useful. And then finally, we have Great Swords, your AP infantry, anti infantry bonus as well of 9. Uh, 32 melee attack, 30 melee defense. They actually have worse combat stats than swordsmen, but they do have 95 armor. Of course, no missile block chance, and they are pretty slow as well, which is a bit painful, but uh, decently cost effective, especially when you consider the support abilities the empire has have the empire the, the empire has access to in terms of their lords and heroes. Uh, keep that in mind as we discuss the stats: is that all of these guys can be buffed up substantially by the uh, the support abilities here. So. Yeah, uh, that's pretty much it for melee infantry. Moving on to missile infantry. Free Company Militia, one of the most cost-effective hybrid units in the game. Only 450 points. They have decent combat stats, a nice missile attack. Uh, they have a full 90 unit models as well, which means they have a higher volume of fire than most skirmishers. Standard numbers for a skirmish unit is only 68, so they do have quite a bit more unit models. They've got okay-ish leadership. It's not amazing. They're pretty quick at 36 speed, but overall for the points, a very cost-effective, again, in lower armor matchups. So factions like Skaven, uh, potentially even the Vampires as well, because they have good melee stats, they can stand against zombie summons relatively well. And so they're probably pretty good in that matchup as well. Things like Mortis Engine doesn't have much armor anyway, so you can get some good value there, certainly. Moving on, we've got the Crossbowmen. Not a whole lot to say here. They're not that great, um, especially when you compare them to other similarly, similarly priced skirmishers from other factions. They don't have any cool utility or anything. And so you really won't see these guys a whole lot. Maybe one or two of them against the Wood Elves to kind of counter skirmish over your own lines, but in general, you won't see them a whole lot. Uh, hand gunners, though, very strong skirmish unit, of course. AP missiles, uh, pretty good refire rate as well. And uh, yeah, they are, of course, very squishy in melee, 600 points, but they are your AP missile option, which is very, very strong to have. Your two regiments of renown here, we've got the Free Company Militia Regiment of Renown, the Sterling's Revenge, quite a bit more expensive, but they do have AP missiles, which makes them very strong, and their combat stats are excellent. 34 uh, attack and 35 melee defense, of course, for 800 points, I mean, 
You can compare this to something like a Shadow Warrior, and it's probably pretty similar, but still, they have the AP missiles. They also have a full 90 unit models, which again, most skirmishers don't have that many. So overall, a very cost-effective unit in quite a few matchups. And then you've got your Regiment of Renown uh, Handgunners, the Silver Bullets. These guys have magic damage, which is great, because there's a lot with physical resistance in the game. And of course, they have a much better refire rate and accuracy, which means they have great DPS. Their other special trait is, of course, that they have stock, so they can remain hidden uh, even outside of the forest, which is a very useful trait to have. You can set up some nice little uh, missile ambushes with them, and they are devastating, certainly. Now, on to the, one of the stronger points of the Empire roster, Heavy Cavalry. So, we've got your basic Empire Knights, 110 armor for only 850 points, which is pretty good. Not the best combat stats, and only 48 charge bonus, which, I mean, is pretty decent. But, uh, you're mainly paying for that 110 armor. These guys are pretty tanky for the cost, and a very cost-effective uh, lower-tier shock cavalry. Reichsguard are you're going to be kind of your epitome of the Empire. They're the ultimate Swiss army knife cav, as I like to call them. Uh, they're good in almost any situation. 62 charge bonus and great combat stats. 120 armor with 40 weapon strength, 12 AP. They're good at charging pretty much any infantry. Uh, I mean, obviously, you don't want to charge like brace halberds from the front, but... Even charging halberds in the rear can be quite useful. They'll do okay in uh, cavalry engagement. They'll do okay at charging down monsters. Of course, they're great for running down skirmishers and artillery. So just in general, a very useful all-around cavalry. At 1,150 points, uh, very, very cost-effective. We've also got the Knights of the Blazing Sun, who are more of a pure shock cavalry, only 50 points more expensive. You can see, compared to the Reichsguard, they do have much more charge bonus. They go up all the way to 78 charge bonus, which is in the realm of some of the other elite tier cavalry in the game. They do gain fire damage as well, so once again, lots of fire synergy, a little bit less armor, leadership, slightly faster. They have less melee defense as well, but slightly higher weapon strength. So, your Knights of the Blazing Sun are good again going to be more of a pure shock cavalry whereas the reichsguard are more of a uh, all around you know just swiss army knife type cav um the zentler's reichsguard are the regiment of renown for the reichsguard they're uh you know just great all around even better combat stats and they are also immune to psychology and have vanguard deployment two very useful traits to have now for the powerhouse, we've got Demigriff Knights. So Demigriff Knights come in two variants, Lance and Shield or Halberd. You're pretty much never going to see the Lance and Shield just because the, they don't have splash attacks. They're okay against Armored Infantry, but just in general, your Demigriff Knights are usually going to be contesting the Cav game or trying to hunt down large monsters, in which case the Halberd is the obvious choice. Bonus versus large of 25. Uh, they've only got 24 unit models, being a monstrous cavalry. They cause fear, 125 armor, and not the best stats in the world, but again, that's where your support buffs come into play. You've got your, excuse me, your warrior priest, arch lector, Karl Franz, uh, you know, you could take Lore of Heavens, other various ways to give melee attacks, even like a light wizard with the Peronus Time Warp. You can buff these guys up so they're much stronger. Then you've got your Regiment of Renown version, the Royal Author of Griffites, who you're going to see in most Empire builds because they cause terror. They are Demigriff Knights with better stats, which is in and of itself awesome, and they also cause terror. Uh, moving on, we've got uh, Missile Calf here, Pistoliers. It's worth noting these guys have two uh, shots per volley, so they do actually have a pretty high volume of fire. Uh, not the best combat stats in the world, but they're skirmish cav, they're fast, they can shoot 360, and their missile attacks do enough damage that they are pretty cost effective at 500 points, and a good option against factions like uh, beastmen, vampires, anywhere where you need a nice skirmish option, but you don't want to necessarily have to protect them. Pistoliers are a good option because, of course, you can either just stick them in skirmish mo mode or if you have the micro, you know, just micro them away uh, and they won't be caught by your opponent, which is uh, always nice. We've also got Outriders. These guys, unfortunately, can't shoot 360, but they do shoot on the move and they have AP missiles. They also have a pretty good rate of fire as well, so they have good DPS overall. They also come in a grenade launcher variant that has less unit models but uh, has this interesting grenade attack that's very good against blobs of uh, especially unarmored infantry. A bit of a niche unit, not very good, but the, uh, the Outriders and the Pistoliers both are pretty solid overall. 
Now on to the final part, and one of the big, one of the other bigger parts is the artillery. Uh, Empire is one of the most powerful artillery factions in the game, really second only to the dwarfs. Uh, so let's get to it. They've got the mortar, which is not that great of an artillery piece to be honest. It doesn't do that much damage to armored units. It's good against low armor, but it has a slow refire rate and it's inaccurate. It's also 700 points, so you really won't see these guys super often. The cannon, on the other hand, the great cannon, is super cost effective. 800 points, a great armor piercing missile damage, direct line of fire, and it also has huge range at 450, one of the longest range artillery pieces in the game. And it also has a regiment of renown variant, the Hammer of Witches, which does magic damage. And uh, for what it's worth, has physical resistance. I guess if you're an in an artillery duel, maybe this will keep the Hammer of Witches alive for a couple extra shots. I don't really know. But uh, it does magic damage, and obviously it has a better refire rate and uh, better accuracy, being that it's a regiment of renown. The magic damage is mostly useful for fight it, for firing at uh, single entity targets with physical resistance, because ha uh, cannons do enough damage to one shot most infantry and cavalry models anyway. Uh, the magic damage really comes into play more when shooting at single entities, so things like when Krokgar's got his sacred spawning up, if you're shooting at someone like Lewin, for example, who's got Blessing of the Lady, other single entity targets that have physical resistance is going to be very useful at uh, shooting them. We've got the Hellblaster Volley Gun, fan favorite, not necessarily super competitive, but it does massive missile damage, has a multi-shot volley attack that's very powerful, has fairly limited range, which is its big biggest uh, limitation. It's also relatively expensive at uh, 1,200 points. Still a pretty good piece, though. Also at 1,200 points is the Hellstorm Rocket Battery. This has much longer range, does pure AP, but, uh, you know, it is pretty inaccurate. It has a large spread of the rockets that it fires, like in a big volley. So I haven't found these things to be wildly useful. Both the Hellblaster and the Hellstorm can be useful in certain niche situations, but uh, they're more of fun picks than anything, although they can certainly be painful if your opponent's not prepared for them. And then finally, uh, I guess not finally, but uh, we've got the Luminarch next, which is your ultimate Laz cannon. Uh, super, super powerful at sniping out single entities. Uh, also comes in a Regiment of Renown variant, which uh, comes with a few extra abilities here. Uh, in terms of the Luminarch, it's got the Aura of Protection. So this is uh, an area of effect 12% damage this is resistance if your magic is above 50% which is always nice. It also has a Locus of Hish, so it drains opponent's uh, power recharge rate uh, for that uh, scales, depending on how many uh, units are nearby, how many enemies are in range. Uh, so very useful to debuff anytime you can debuff your opponent's power recharge rate. And then the Regiment of Renown comes with uh, Net of Amantok as a bound ability, so it can pin units in place. And it also has Encourage, which is always nice. Uh, gives that nice leadership buff. The main thing with the Luminarch is it has just insanely high missile damage. It can one-shot, well not quite one-shot, but just almost one-shot like Tomb King's Lords. It does magic and fire damage as well, so uh, yeah, just huge damage at uh, single targets. Very powerful and yet very expensive artillery piece, although it is mobile, uh, at least somewhat so. At 50 speed, it's certainly more mobile than a traditional artillery piece and a bit faster than most infantry, although it won't be able to get away from most cavalry. And finally, last and certainly the least and the most expensive, the steam tank. The sad, sad steam tank with its pitiful 10 melee defense, its horrible 180 weapon strength. It is unbreakable and it has 160 armor, so I guess that's a thing. And it also has a missile attack, which is pretty long range and reasonably accurate, which is also a thing. But generally, I would advise ever taking a steam tank. So uh, now that we've talked about the roster, let's talk about the Empire in general. The Empire is, as I described with the Reichsguard, the Swiss Army Knife faction. They can do just about everything reasonably well. They have good cavalry, well, they have excellent cavalry, I would say. They have 
excellent artillery, they have a wide selection of magic, they have decent monsters. The monsters is probably one of the, the areas where they lack most compared to other factions. They also have kind of underwhelming infantry. Uh, the infantry certainly on the lower end is very cost effective, but their higher tier infantry tends to struggle, uh, especially against elite missile factions. Things like great swords, flagellants, halberdiers are just really not great against missile factions. Um, and so your lower tier infantry are really going to be the way to go there. So really the, the lack of elite infantry and the lack of monsters are their main uh, uh, deficiencies. In terms of weaknesses though, I mean the Empire is so well balanced that it can be very tricky to game plan against them. My advice would be to try and out something them, right? Because the Empire can do anything pretty well and most Empire builds that you'll face will have some uh, level of combined arms. That's cavalry, uh, artillery, monsters, everything all working together. So if you can, for example, out cavalry them, if you're playing as Bretonia, if you can win the cavalry engagement, even against the faith demis, um, then you should be able to clean up the infantry line, right? Or if you're playing as the dwarves, if you can out artillery them, theoretically, you can shoot them to pieces before they get to you, right? So Again, if whatever faction you're fighting the Empire as, you want to try and out-something them. Out-infantry them, out-artillery them, out-cavalry them, out-monster them. If you can win on one phase, then in theory you should be able to mop up the other phases as well. Easier said than done, though, as the Empire... Ah, oh, man, they, they're tricky to game plan against. In terms of builds with the Empire, uh, I want to just share a few concepts, a few core concepts, and then kind of let you guys work out most of your builds for yourselves, but um, there are a few things here. I've talked before about Faith Demis, but in general, putting your uh, Arch Lector or Warrior Priest, you want to make sure to put them on the horse, not the Barded War Horse, just the regular War Horse, because they're too slow on the Barded War Horse to keep up with Demigriff Knights, but if you put them on the horse, and then you take uh, the Hammer of Sigmar and the Shield of Faith, I would recommend taking both. Uh, to buff up your Demigriff Knights, particularly the Royal Altar of Griffites um, with the Arch Lector just become insanely scary and you can murderize most monsters and big lords and other cavalry and just things in general with this. It's super powerful. Uh, another, f um, although I will say with this you're pretty much gonna always need a Jade Wizard to keep these guys alive if you're running uh, an Arch Lector. Uh, one build I have also run is Balthazar with like a, a double Warrior Priest. So you get two Warrior Priests supporting each group of Demis. It is a bit riskier not to have healing, but um, Balthazar does come with quite a few uh, nice abilities in himself. Um, in terms of like overall builds here, I would definitely recommend uh, you almost always fill out your hero slots. Um, so something like this, this is kind of your uh, more standard Empire build, I guess, would be to have Boris up on the Griffin. Uh, personally, I cut Crush the Weak and most of these other abilities to make Boris as cheap as possible, because the Empire has some pretty cost-effective lower tier units. I like to bring as many of those as I can. White Cloak of Ulrich, though, being non-conditional, is going to be pretty useful to have, so we'll take that. The minus 9 speed in particular, or sorry, 6% speed, can help Boris get away in a tight pinch, although it's not a whole lot of a speed debuff. It is something, certainly. And then with Boris, you can either take Lore of Shadows or Lore of Heavens, uh, would be the two I'd recommend. Uh, this is a build that's going to be probably fo focused on fighting, uh, like, one of the elf factions, I would say. Uh, let's say, well, I don't know, actually. I might take a different build against the High Elves entirely. Um... Maybe like the green skins, or I don't know, just in general a Boris build, I guess, if you want to take Boris. A lot of people think that he's the most competitive, but with Lore of Shadows, I'll usually take these three spells. With Lore of Heavens, I'll usually take uh, the same, the first three. So, uh, Harmonic Convergence, uh, Wind Blast, and Curse the Midnight Wind. Curse the Midnight Wind in particular, if you're fighting someone like the Dwarves, can help your Empire State Troops trade cost-effectively in a melee engagement. Uh, Swordsman will, if you keep Curse of the Midnight Wind up whenever it comes off cooldown. Swordsmen will beat uh, Dwarf Warriors. At least last time I tested it, they would. So, uh, Lore of Heavens definitely can be very useful there. Boris, of course, up on the Griffin gives you AP. So, let's kind of make this an anti-Dwarf build, although <laughs> that's, a, that's a really rough matchup, uh, potentially. Um, 
yeah. Uh, you could take maybe like some Outriders to do some harassing, uh, maybe some Reichsguard to try and get into the back line. If you could get the Zintler's Reichsguard in the back, that would be quite useful. Let's get a whole bunch of Swordsmen as well, and then we're going to need some kind of missile units. Uh, the Silver Bullets, because they have stock, might be nice, although the magic damage is pretty rough. The Sterling's Avenge can potentially be useful here if they can get in close. Now we've only got about 500 more points, so maybe we take some free company as well. I don't know that this build is actually any good. I'm just kind of spitballing here, but in terms of builds that I've used uh, with a little bit more... Um, or I just used a little bit more, I guess. Uh, this is uh, my Balthazar Lord Sniping build. So you've got Balthazar up in the air. He's got Final Transmutation only with the Staff of Volans. And uh, you can actually cut Metal Shifting. And uh, he's just got Arcane Conduit, Staff of Volans, and that uh, Final Transmutation. I've also got a Luminarch and a Witch Hunter. And all of this is going to be focused on sniping your opponent's Lord. So against factions like uh, Greenskins, even Norska to a degree... Beastmen, it doesn't necessarily work great against. There's other ways that it are better at Lord Sniping Beastmen. But in general, any faction that can't heal their Lord, uh, somebody like Skaven as well, this would probably be pretty good against. Any faction that can't heal their Lord, if you can snipe out their Lord early on with this type of build, then you come in with the Terror of the Royal Altar of Griffites and mop up a whole lot of their units. Of course, the uh, Temple of Hoff Luminarch, you want to try and secure the mobility game as quickly as possible, which is why the Faith Demis and the Reichsguard are so important here. If you can secure the mobility game, then you've got the Temple Hoff Luminarch uh, to run around with impunity and just blast your opponent in the back. Um, so yeah, against those factions, I think that build's pretty decent. Against the Beastmen, I think this is a better way to go about Lord Sniping. So uh, I might modify this build a little bit here and there, but the double terror bomb of the Amber Wizard and Boris, I find, is pretty strong because the Beastmen generally are weak to terror. If you can come in with a big, strong rear charge with a griffin, do a ton of shock damage, and then also apply that terror, uh, it's very useful at routing off even higher-end beastman units like Bestigor. You can terrify away pretty quickly. Uh, fire builds are also pretty good against the beastman because they do have some units that are weak to fire. Morgher is weak to fire, although he has magic resistance. So you got to be careful about how you go about doing that. Um, likewise... Uh, the Butchers of Kalkengard, of course, are also weak to fire. So that's why I've got, uh, I think, yeah, I've got the Banner of Eternal Flame on this Warrior Priest here. So that if my opponent does end up bringing any of those units, either Morgher, which you're probably going to see just about every time, or the Butchers of Kalkengard, which are another very common pick, I can run this guy with whoever's fighting the Butchers, and uh, he'll be able to apply that Banner of Eternal Flame, whether it's the Reichsguard. Uh, it even applies to missile attacks, so I, you could run him with the Pistoliers and just shoot the Butchers of Kalkengard to death. Or, uh, you know, if you're trying to dive Morgur, then you run this guy over to Boris and the Amber Wizard, who are fighting Morgur, and then suddenly they get fire damage without magic damage, and so they'll do extra damage to uh, to Morgur himself. So this is kind of my anti-Beastman build. Again, I might make some modifications here and there. Sometimes I might bring a Bright Wizard just to go full fire. Um, but yeah, in general, that's that build. Uh, let's see here. What other Presate builds do I have here? Uh, this is my Karl Franz Horse build. Although now I might modify this to bring him on Deathclaw, just because after watching that Triple Shagoth game, I realized he's pretty powerful up on the uh, up on the old Griffin there. But this type of build is something that I would run more now with the Archlector, because I think he's a little bit better of a pure support character. I mean, obviously he doesn't have the combat stats of Franz, so there's that difference. But the Grand Hammer of Sigmar and the Grand Shield of Faith, more or less. Uh, fulfill the same role that the Reichland Runefang did before. And this also gives you an extra 900 points to spend somewhere else. So, you know, you could bring uh, another unit of Empire Knights, maybe some Pistoliers, you know, you could grab another Great Cannon. A lot you could do, even just a couple more Swordsmen might be pretty useful. Uh, this is a build I would recommend against the High Elves. I actually, maybe I would cut this Witch Hunter for just another, uh, another Warrior Priest here. Cut him down a little bit. Yeah, something like this I think would be something I'd more re recommend against the High Elves. Hammer of Witches is going to be great uh, at taking down enemy cavalry. Uh, of course, the Royal Altar Griffites with the Archlector are going to be great at doing that also. Uh, since we don't have any other Demis, I guess we could just run this guy on the ground and have him 
excuse me, help support the state troops. And uh, yeah, in general you'll see a lot of my builds don't use nets and guns super heavily. Nets and guns used to be the way in uh, Total War Warhammer 1, but with how um, things have been changed recently um, w in regards to... Oh, I just totally lost my train of thought. Anyway, um, oh, Net of Amatok, right. It used to be an air of effect. Now it's only a single target unless you overcast it. So that's why nets and guns aren't quite as prevalent as they used to be. Um, this is my Arch Lecter build here. Uh, one of my other Arch Lecter builds, I should say, which is uh, pretty similar. This time, instead, we've got a couple of Outriders. This would be a build I would take more on a, on a map that's broken up and I can't use direct line of sight artillery. I'll take the Outriders instead because they can run around and apply missiles uh, with a uh, apply armor piercing missiles that is with uh, some nice mobility. We've got the Great Swords buffed up by the Warrior Priest on the ground. The Spearmen might want to take shields on them if you can afford it, but uh, Arch Lecter, of course, going to be running with the Demis and just in general buffing things up so it's a few kind of sample empire builds although honestly again the empire is one of those factions that i have these pre-made builds but a lot of the time i'll just go in and and make a build whatever i feel like in that particular battle because the empire is so diverse and so well balanced you can really go a lot of different directions so hopefully i've been able to kind of uh, shed some light on some things for you guys let me know your comments down below what you thought about this um what uh, what faction you want me to do next and how I could go about improving um, yeah hopefully you guys found this informative if you do like this sort of content be sure to subscribe uh, hit that bell notification button so when I do upload new videos you'll be notified thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time